When we talk about public communication, we use the word communication deliberately because we're thinking of three forms of communicating. Straightforward proclamation of the gospel, uh, the use of apologetics, that's a reason, defense of the Christian faith, and then involvement in dialogue uh, and debate, all three. Now, very few people can do all three. The person who has this gift, who is the, like a sharp-edged instrument, is often not very good at dialogue and debate because it's a different thing. The bona fide evangelist often, you feel with them as if they've pinned you in a corner and you can't leave unless you decide one way or the other. It's a different approach when it comes to dialogue in public. So sometimes people have debates with atheists. So John Lennox is involved and has a debate with Richard Dawkins or something like that. Um, and apologetic lectures, usually they start further back where you're trying to deal with some of the objections that people have to the Christian faith. The weakness of many apologists, including some I've talked with here over the last 10 years, is they can start so far back, they don't actually eventually get to the gospel. I remember talking with one Dutch friend and said, what questions are you dealing with these days? And he said things like, how can I know anything at all? And I said, uh, how often do you speak about the day, death, and resurrection of Jesus? He said, oh, oh, we almost never get that far in the Netherlands. I said, are you seeing any people become Christians? He said, almost none. He said, well, do you think it's, the reason is you're not getting to the deity, death, and resurrection of Jesus. You've got to get there eventually because that's the gospel. So Francis Schaeffer used to take, use the term taking the roof off the position of someone else in order that the gospel can come into the house. The weakness of some apologists is that they take the roof off, but they don't then proclaim the gospel into that context. And our vision is for what we would call teaching evangelism. That, that is, both disarming false views and then teaching the gospel and biblical truth in relation to key questions like, where is God in the midst of suffering? What is God like? Uh, in what sense is Jesus unique? Can we trust the New Testament documents? I, I, is there a distinctive biblical view of sexuality that God has given you start with these things, but eventually you've got to get to the deity, death, and resurrection of Jesus, or you don't see people converted. So we believe in a, what we would call persuasive evangelism, another word for apologetics, but we think you have to go further than just disarming, answering questions. There is then the dimension of proclamation, facing people with the person and the claims of Jesus. Proclamation is not on its own, though, in isolation. It's always together with personal and small group evangelism. In the New Testament, you always have all three in the Acts of the Apostles. It's not either or. And proclamation is usually not very fruitful if individual believers are not gossiping the gospel and if you're not de uh, encountering, helping people to encounter the person of Christ in the text of Scripture at the same time because that breaks down misunderstanding. You have to do all three. And a common misconception is proclamation only and then people say it doesn't work because they don't see people come to meetings. Why? Because they don't have any Christian friends. Or personal and small group evangelism and a loss of confidence in public proclamation. It is our conviction that there's never been a revival in the history of the church where there have not been preachers come to the fore. It's never happened. You always have the rise of people who can articulate the gospel sharply and in a compelling fashion whatever the culture, all through the history of the church. You can't transfer, you can't change a culture based on small groups. It just doesn't happen. It didn't happen in the Reformation. It's never happened in Europe. You've got to have all three. But then in addition, we use creative approaches like music, drama, film, art, which we see as the servant of the spoken word. That's why with young people especially, there's an interest in music, drama, film, art, and one of the key questions most theologians in Europe have not answered is this. How do you communicate a word-based faith in a visually saturated culture? Now, Luke speaks a lot on that. So you have to start with uh, engaging people with film clips, or uh, I often use paintings to connect with people, or pop songs and so on. Let me give one illustration. When my son was studying in Nice in the south of France, there was a group of six Christians in the university. They weren't allowed on the campus. 
So the three guys got an apartment together alongside the campus. This is all they did. Every Monday night, they invited folks for a pizza and watched a film, uh, which touched on a key existential theme, like the search for intimacy or significance. And then they said, at the end of the film, no discussion, but Thursday night, we're going to have, this is a key issue for us as young people, Thursday night, we're going to have a look at a passage in the Bible, which looks at the theme of the search for love or the search for significance. If you want to come along, come along. The group grew from six to 60 in one year. They didn't do anything else. Pizza, film, Bible study, community, that was it. And they were from all over the world. I've never seen, I've known the Nice University for 40 years. The only time I've seen that happen. It's a brilliant connecting of film and speaking. And I said to my son, which films are you watching? Which, ho which Christian films are you watching? He laughed. He said, we're not looking at any Christian films, Dad. In English, he said, they're naff. They're useless. <laughs> And I said, well, what are you doing? He said, we are watching Hollywood films which address existential human questions, like the search for love. And they, they touch the issue better often than, than we do in Christian films, but they don't have the answer. So then we come in with the gospel, the film having opened up the issue. And that's where filmmakers are strong, of course. So... And this is where there are members all across the continent now. In 10 years ago, they were just there and there, Britain and Germany. So it's spread across Europe. And in the last four years, this is where they've done missions all across the continent. Now, we work together. There are 60 of us. Um, but each year we meet, uh, we have a, an annual conference where we have training in small groups. We have models of evangelistic talks. Um, we deal with key apologetic questions. There are about 10 people here who are involved. Stefan Gustafsson uh, is often one of the speakers. For example, John Lennox is there uh, every year. Uh, and about four years ago, we realized that there were a group of academics across Europe it, within the university who could speak from within their academic discipline and open the door for us, for the evangelists to come in. So typically, we ask someone like John Lennox or Os Guinness or someone else to go in first we try to persuade the university to invite them to speak. And then the evangelistic team goes in the following week off the back of the university lecturer. Let me just quickly trace the stages as to how, first of all, why did we put this emphasis on developing public evangelists? Well, it's because of I mentioned in a, uh, earlier uh, two particular reasons. The first is as you read the Acts of the Apostles and you ask what's the model in the Acts of the Apostles for evangelism, uh, you see those three elements, public proclamation, small groups or house to house, and what some theologians call gossiping the gospel, all three at the same time. And uh, the church usually grows when you have those. If you read Acts 8 and Acts 12, Antioch, two different Greek words are used there, gossiping the gospel as the believers were scattered and public proclamation, both at the same time. So anybody who tries to argue that proclamation should not occur because we're in word-resistant cultures has to try and defend themselves over against the weight of Scripture, because the weight of Scripture in Acts. If we say we're going to develop our approach and our methodology based on biblical principles, it's inescapable. The emphasis at the same time on proclamation, small group or house to house, and uh, gossiping the gospel. It's there in the New Testament. Seven public sermons evangelistically, both to people with a religious background and non-religious. Secondly, as I mentioned in church history, particularly in the Reformation and elsewhere, and particularly in revivals, you always see the emergence of public evangelists. And it's our conviction you cannot see a turnaround in Europe and the transformation of cultures unless you do two things. Proclaim the gospel in public. And secondly, this is what the Reformers did in the Reformation, demonstrate the superiority of the biblical worldview in every sphere of life over against secular and other worldviews. Often historians have missed that out, and it was central in the way that Luther and Calvin worked when they showed how the New Testament scriptures related, for example, to uh, education, to the role of women, um, to uh, 
uh, uh, religious liberty, and so many other things. They all have their roots in Calvin and Luther's defense of the biblical worldview in the culture, and that's what shaped Europe. What most church historians focus on is their doctrinal clarity, rediscovery of the great doctrines of justification by grace through faith, priesthood of all believers, the centrality and authority of scripture, but they went way beyond that to show how it applied to every sphere of life. My conviction, if we want to see Europe turned down, you, you have, to ha have to do both in our cultural uh, context. So why do it? Uh, that's the reasoning behind it.